together. And we spend six weeks learning how Ottawa works. And so civic literacy is one of our key offerings in terms of wanting Ottawa to be a city that understands that a city is its people. It's one of the core foundation beliefs of Synapse City that a city is its people. And to support people becoming city makers effectively, we spend time on civic learning. So this piece does slot in to our civic education. And I hope you come away from this with some sense of the role of the counselor, what they do, how to interact with them to, for your own initiatives, um, and, a part, and also with the questions that you're bringing to this as we turn to the Q&A. Let me um, introduce our guests and I'm delighted to see them. Alex Cullen had a lengthy political career in both municipal and provincial politics, including being an Ottawa City Councillor for Bay Ward from 2000 to 2014. Currently, he's serving as president of the Federation of Citizens Associations of Ottawa. His wife, by the way, is the current Bay Ward Councillor, Teresa Cavanaugh. Alex is also a committed and dedicated and passionate endurance athlete in triathlons and cross-country skiing, as a personal note. Clive Doucette was the city councillor for Capital Ward from 2001 to 2010. He ran for mayor of Ottawa twice, most recently in 2018, where he finished second to Mayor Watson. A small and uh, what I find to be a very compelling factoid in his youth, he spent some time helping to build the NAC as a construction worker. So we often times talk about city building and, and Clive took it literally, which is just a, a terrific bit. He's also an author, by the way, of fiction, nonfiction plays and poetry. And his most recent work of nonfiction is Urban Meltdown, Cities, Climate Change and Politics as Usual. Marion Wilkinson was the city councilor for Kanata North Ward from 2006 to 2018 and had a nearly 50 year career in service to all things Kanata, including, by the way, when it was incorporated, serving as its first mayor from 1978 to 1985. Marion is now in the process of writing a book about Kanata, subtitled, How the Community Created an Award-Winning City. And Marion, I love that title because it is so aligned with the values and ethos of Synapse City. So we'll look forward to that book when it, uh, when it comes out. So I wanna ask some questions and we'll start uh, simply and we'll get more complex. And I'm gonna play out a number of scenarios and feel like you can enrich the scenarios as they, as they uh, help. So imagine I'm a citizen and I, just, I, I notice there's something on my street that's bothering me. And let's say it's that traffic is going really fast. There's young families on the street and I want speed bumps put in. So I decide as a citizen, I should mention one other thing. I'm gonna use the word citizen a lot because it, its original meaning was city dweller. It wasn't, it was sort of been co-opted to me and I'm, I hold a passport from a nation state. So I'm gonna use it as an engaged city dweller. Okay, so there's a citizen who decides they wanna put in speed bumps. They go and they talk to some other residents in their neighborhood who are also aligned with that and think, yeah, you know what, it's a good idea. This citizen, reaches out to you, what would you tell that citizen to do? And what is it that you would then go do once you've been in conversation with the citizen? So what if I kick this off, Marion, what if you just lead with this scenario? What the citizen comes to you talking about their street and wanting speed bumps, what do you tell them? What do you go do? First of all, I say what we have to do is look at what the problem is, not the solution to start with because some solutions are not viable. For example, on a major road with buses, they won't let you put speed bumps in anyway, but there are other things you can do. So I would have them say, we have to evaluate what the situation is. If it's too much speeding, then we have to look at what are some of the things that can get done. Some can be done now directly by the counselor because we have a small budget that we can use for things like signage and the, the, uh, the flashing things that tell you how fast you're going, that type of thing, which is pretty fast to do. The other things we can do is to take it to the city. So I, I would actually probably want to sit, say, if you've got a group, sit down and meet with us. Let's go over what you want to have done. Let's look at some of the possibilities. So when we go to meet with the city staff, we're going with a knowledgeable person. You have to be knowledgeable when you try to get things done because otherwise they will just poo-poo you. They sometimes poo-poo you anyway because they don't always like to listen to people, but the, uh, it gives you a much better advantage. If you know what it's all about and you have some ideas of things that could get done, 
And then you've got to be, you've got to stick with it. You can't give up because sometimes these things take quite a bit of time. And I could also give them advice about how you can get others out there to help you because the more people involved, usually the better it is to get a result. Okay, thank you. Marion, I'm curious, so what expectations would you set for this citizen and her fellow citizens who want to do this? What, what, what should she expect? Well, she should expect that I'm going to be listening to them. She should expect that I am going to uh, make some suggestions. She's going to think that I will offer some things that I as a counselor could do under the, 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 pro the programs that we have that counselors can do. And then I'm going to su suggest a process that, to, that could be followed to try to get more. Thank you. Uh, Alex, I want to check with you if there's anything you would add. And I'm curious, what, what is it that you do behind the scenes? Yeah. So I, uh, Marianne really outlined the first thing you do is you listen. Uh, you want to validate that that person uh, perceptions of what's going on on their street is shared by others. Uh, I've been in communities that wanted speed humps. I've been in communities that did not want speed humps. Uh, but you want to engage the community. They, they see a, a speeding problem. What are the solutions? Marian mentioned there may be a range. So you want to meet with them. You want to bring in city staff to explore what the options are. Uh, and then you want to facilitate how you get a solution in place. So there's a, a learning curve for everybody, uh, but the expectation is that some one way or the other, you're gonna address the, that community's concerns. Uh, and behind the scenes, it's um, after uh, realizing, yes, we have an issue, say on Berlin Street, which is where I live, um, uh, we've talked to the counselor. The counselor would pick up the phone and start talking to the folks over at Road Safety and say, look, I've got a community here that's concerned about it. What are my options? Uh, what can I do with, within my own purview? Is there a program I can piggyback on? Is there something bigger that I have to go to committee for? If it's all within my purview, okay, that's gonna be easy. If I have to go to committee, then I've gotta go back to the community and say, look, we gotta show up. We gotta to explain to eight, nine counselors who don't know your community, what's going on. You have to show that we have looked at the alternatives and this is what we're prepared to do. Uh, so the counselor is a facilitator. Um, the, there's a, a you know, big city bureaucracy with lots of money and lots of road stuff going on, but can we actually get a piece of that to meet this community's needs? Alex, do I, do I as the citizen, you've got all these other things going on on your agenda besides just the request of my street to have speed bumps. You've got all sorts of other things on your plate. Do I have to be the proverbial squeaky wheel in order for it to keep moving forward? Do I have to keep no. the door on this or, or should I just assume, yes, my counselors got it. They, they're going with no. it. They know it's on their agenda. Well, I'm, I'd like to say you could leave it in my hands, but you know, unfortunately it varies from uh, counselor to counselor to counselor because there is a lot of stuff on the plate. Uh, but a, re a responsible counselor, once he's picked up the ball, owes that, that community a response, uh, owes that community that you've worked the system to try to meet their needs. So you, it, it's a good politics, good policy to keep them in the feedback loop and let them know what's going on, that they haven't been forgotten. And if they haven't heard from you, well, of course, they're going to call you up and say, hey, you know, Alex, what have you been doing? And so it's a two way street. Um, my line always with communities is build a relationship with your counselor. Don't let them be strangers. Let them know what's going on in your community. And so that counselor should know this street's a busy street and something needs to happen. Thank you. Um, Clive, let me, let me flip the question. Suppose there's a community group and there's, or a citizen, and there's something they want to stop from happening. In, in other words, not something they want to create like a speed bump, but suppose the city has decided they want to change some zoning in the ward to make it a, a commercial space. Um, maybe some city staff have made a recommendation that this space be changed to zoning so it can be commercial. And citizens want to stop that initiative. Is there, what changes in that dynamic when it's to stop something that, that the city wants to move forward with and citizens in the ward want to say, wait, what, what happens with that when they go to you with a request that's a, how do we stop this momentum that seems to be building? Well, I think it's important to under, understand the history of whatever you're doing. Like on, on speed bumps, for example, we've come a very long way. I remember, Alex, you probably remember on Lion Street, we had 30 accidents a year. We couldn't get any speed bumps on them for years. We finally got six. And within this, the next year, we had three accidents. 
we went from 30 to three. Some people's porches were torn off actually by cars just ricocheting off because uh, it was sort of, it turned into an access ramp for the Queensway. So that was our first huge success, a really big success. No one could deny the stats. And then, and then I think I, I brought forward in the old city of Ottawa, we had 50 kilometer neighborhood speeds. And I realized one time that the only place, all the suburban areas had 40. So at Christmas time, I brought up a little motion saying, hey, we want 40 kilometers in the Glebe. And it was a huge fight. And, but finally they realized they couldn't have, I said, okay, then you've got to bump up the, the, the speed limit in the, in, the, in the suburban areas to the 50 clicks, make it even. And you know what, we got it, we got it right away. So I think understanding the history of your issue is, is really key. So you can have an intelligent, informed and useful dialogue, but say something you want to stop, say it's a high rise. Say, it's, say they're, re, they're rezoning the corner. It's, it's zoned on your community plan for, for four stories and they want to put eight or 26 stories. Well, if you look at the history, you'll find out that almost the developer almost always gets it in the old city, never not gets it. It doesn't matter really how high they get it, they always get it. So I would say, say to them, you know, you're probably wasting your time because they're going to get it. Uh, the, the, you've got a basically developer-led city. Uh, but if you really want to go at it hammer and tongs, then get some money because you're going to have to go to the, to now it's called LAPAC or something. Uh, you're going to have to go to the OMB. And even then you're going to have trouble because I know when Roosevelt in Westboro, they, they succeeded at the, at the OMB on, it was like 2% succeed on, on, on rezonings. And they succeeded and all they did, the, 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 the council then tried to grandfather the rezoning and changed, couldn't do it, was illegal. And so, they, and so the developer waited for a couple of years and now they've got their 16 stories or whatever they wanted on the fourth story. So I would say know, know the history of whatever the issue is. If, if you have a, a really good chance of success, success like in, in, in traffic calming, where we've come a long, long way, not just with speed bumps, but bull boats and, and, uh, and boulevard plantings and so forth, then, then it's just really a question of getting the, the, the best mix for what your, your, your street, as, as, as Marianne indicated. You know, it, it could be all kinds of things. It might not be a speed bump, it might be just be bull boats. Or, or tightenings, uh, road things. Um, but if it's for, uh, it's for a developer-led uh, rezoning and you want to stop that, good luck. I, I, and, and, I, and I think since, uh, since uh, Alex and I left, uh, there's been a real sea change in the culture. When I was a, a capital city councillor, there wasn't a single rezoning in, in the ward over above what was laid out in the official plan and the community plans. There is now all up and down Bank Street, everywhere you turn in Westboro. And, uh, and so if we want to tackle that, I would say you have to change the culture in Ottawa. Yeah, and that is, you're doing that. With so The reason why I was happy to be in Synapsis, you, you are doing that. You, you're trying to change the culture. And the culture has to change the one that's more engaged. And, you know, it's not just about winning in the Glebe or Westboro or whatever. We have to start winning right across the city. And the people in, who, are, who are coming forward to whatever ward they happen to be in, across, whether it's in Orleans or whatever, have to start realizing that their, their fight on, say, the developer issue is related to every other one. Because you can't, you can't win the developer issue on a worldwide ward basis. You can only win it on a citywide basis. And right now, except for you know, initiatives like Horizon Ottawa and Synapsis, Synapse City and, and so forth, there's very little of this civil culture that you see in Montreal and Toronto which can grab the whole city by the neck, pick it up and shake it. And that's what you have to do on the, on, on the bigger issues. Thanks, Alex. Just to, just to pick up on, on, on the, the, the specific example of a rezoning in a corner. If it's just left to the local residents and, and working with the local council, Clive's quite right. Um, your chances of success are low because you're going before planning committee, which has, I believe now, uh, 10 or 11 people. And they're not familiar with that community. They're hearing, they're getting a report from city staff. They're dealing with professionals. So you have to, you have to make it a public issue. More people need to know about it because that changes the culture around the table. If, ever, if it's been in the news, then people know that other eyes are watching this. And then you have to gain allies because you need uh, other votes around that table. Your councillor may show up for you. That's nice, but that's one vote and you need a majority. 
Yeah. So you uh, mobilizing your community, getting a strategy in place, having enough time, meeting with the counselors, trying to find other people who will support you, whether it's a heritage organization or a, a school council group or um, a BIA. It, it so it's more than just the local community. You have to branch out and you have to work the political process. It is a bit of an uphill battle because all those councillors on planning committee have already been lobbied by that developer. So uh, you're, the community, by, by the time it wakes up, it just can't show up at committee and say, this is bad. It's got to do all the prep work that the developer already has. The developer's gone in, talked to staff, uh, made the accommodation with staff. The developer's gone in, talked to the counselors, said, look, it meets the official plan. This is a good thing. And no one's there to say, hey, yeah, but you're taking down these trees. You are ruining the view of everyone's backyard. You're doing this, you're doing that. So that education part, um, is a lot of uh, planning, a lot of strategizing, a lot of early engagement in the political process if you're going to change that vote. Not even just that. There's a whole psyche right now that high rise is in is God, if I can put it that way. Uh, we have for the first time ever in Canada now got an application in for a 28 and a 30 story building. Um, and they're all rental. I don't know where these people renting are going to come from. We've got about enough rental coming into Canada in the next year to have handle the whole city of Ottawa. But it's, uh, it, you have to, and it's in, that's in an area where it's supposed to go. So I don't have a problem with that part of it. We decided where people should go, but we have them trying to change the official plan as well. There's a, a part of our Canada North business park, the most important business park in Canada. They want to change it to allow four stars and four story apartment buildings. And that means they have to change the official plan too. And the city staff seen it's all quite okay with them. So it's a case of, uh, and there's all sorts of other problems, the drainage and everything else, and they just seem to ignore it. So it's, it's a case of trying to get the official plan, which they're working on now. And I know that the association, the community association has asked them to defer it because it's so general, they can do anything with it. And it doesn't protect any part of the city at all anymore. Mary, and that's what they want to do. I know that's what they want to do. They want to have it so that the staff can do anything they want, but professional planners aren't always the ones that make the best cities. So it's can I want to come in here just because there's this, there's this triangle relationship I see emerging and maybe that's not the right way to characterize it, but it is citizens, uh, developers, and I almost want to say city staff. And I'm wondering if you could give us some sense of the, the, the relationship between a counselor and city staff and what goes on in that relationship, and it can be around development issues and high rises, but give us a flavor for what that relationship is and how that works. Who wants well, to it, is a three, it is it is a three ring circus. Technically, the staff work for city council, city council works for the citizens, but um, city councillors are elected, they're busy, they're dealing with their communities, they're dealing with city functions. The professional staff are working within city policy. These are policies that council has approved um, and the, but the the uh, developers know that if they can get a staff report that uh, that recommends their project, they're three quarters of the way there because it comes to committee. Um, the uh, uh, politicians are supposed to have read the report. Uh, there is that uh, consultation period. They will receive public delegations. And as I say, if you just show up at the time at the committee, you're way behind the eight ball. So it's if you know an application is coming, usually you see a big board put on, on, on the site that an application has been filed. There is a timeline that it has to be done, but usually it's three, four or five months. So that's the time for the community to get organized, the community to make the connection with city staff to understand what are the rules that they're following and then understand where where the weak spots are, where the strong spots are, because the developer is going to have something on their side that you have to deal with, and be able to then go to the counselor and provide the counselor with the questions to ask of staff to see if there can be mitigation or to see if there's a, a flaw there that this thing can turn on. So that sometimes the, the, the counselor is a ping pong ball going back and forth between the community and staff. Uh, but um, if if the community has gotten to the council earlier, then the counselor is a, is a weapon, a tool to ask the right questions, get the right issues in front of people so that maybe the staff can move over, uh, make adjustments, the developer seeing that there's going to be opposition might modify the proposal. There may be some middle ground. Well, Alex, um, I don't think, I think you're, what you're saying works if you have very well, if you have good faith in the system, but you don't have good faith. 
we all know what happens. We all know that the developers are going to get exactly what they ask for every time. So, but you you can't just give up. And I think one of the things it's and it's even doubly hard, triply, quadruply hard now because of COVID. Because I think basically people are just trying to survive. I mean, they're surviving, you know, income loss, they're surviving loneliness, they're surviving separation from their families. I mean, there is no appetite not that I detect. We're in a kind of a hibernation period, which I hope is a good one. I hope when we come out of this COVID isolation, we will come out with, with, um, with, uh, with bells on and we will see uh, really uh, ma many, many changes on every level, climate change, federal government, locally, everywhere. That's, but it's not gonna happen right now. So what do you do right now, Ken? What are you saying? What do you do right now? What I think you, you do is you have to form allies at the civic level, at the grassroots level, and to get ready to go to war. Because that basically, that's what I was at. I was at war for 12 years on council. And in some ways I'm still at war. And, and so how do you go to war? You go to where you've got friends, allies. When we went the North-South Light Rail Line, we formed something, I think Alex will probably remember it, the City Center Coalition. And it was a coalition of seven or eight uh, community associations. And we had people going around to them giving what I realize now is sort of a Synapse City kind of lectures where they would talk about how we needed to connect together to, 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 to get about to get North South Light Rail. Because at the time, I know this sounds like ancient history, they were talking about widening Bronson. And that would have really, really disrupted the whole, it would have been like the Spadina Expressway of, of Ottawa. And so we, we, we had uh, volunteers, citizens, ordinary citizens like, like um, uh, Cam Robertson uh, would go around in their, in their time in the evenings and make a little presentation saying, look, we're looking at having this north-south little rail line because the rail line there already to, um, to replace the Bronson Expressway. And when, so when we finally came to council, which was a year or so later, it wasn't just me and, uh, and, 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 and a, and, and, and a couple of community associations. It was nine community, uh, ward community associations and a whole raft of councillors. So suddenly the mayor of the time was much more attentive to what we wanted because he realized, oh, he, he doesn't get elected just on a ward basis. He's got elected on a citywide basis. And so my, my, my kind of part in getting for citizens what, what, what they wanted was making it sure that if the mayor voted against one of one of the issues that we were bringing forward, he would pay because it was because he was elected citywide, and he can afford basically to put the screws to one ward and one councillor without any trouble at all. But when you get to nine or ten, it starts to make you sweat, and that's what we did over and over again for, and, and we got a huge amount done. Um, and allies and, are key. Allies are very much key. You can't that's operate that's as a single person. It, you can generate something or start to generate something, but you won't succeed unless you make allies. Yeah. But the original question was how we would work with staff. And I want to get hmm. back to that part of it. I spent a lot of time dealing with staff because I found if I could get staff to on, on the side that I could help. But we had an apart, apart, apartment building that came in for 18 stories. I worked with the staff. They looked at the official plan. We did, we did, we analyzed the official plan for them and the zoning because the people in Canada are great analysts. And, uh, but it ended up, it's now seven stories, right? We got it down to a reasonable rate. So it was going from a three story to a 10 story. He did it in between. And I was able to do that because the staff member agreed to work with the community and actually listen to the community. So if you can get a good rapport with the staff who are working on any particular area and they keep changing them, which is a real problem, then it's amazing sometimes what you can get, but you don't get it every time. And I also spent a lot of time in doing zoning and things like that in the initial town center, for example, and working with the community and the staff went along with making changes that the community wanted. The developer didn't like them, but they weren't so onerous that they couldn't live with them. So it's, it's a case of trying to, to come up. Sometimes it's, it's a balancing act all the time. You don't get everything that you want, but if you really work hard on it, and I don't believe in going to war with them unless it's absolutely necessary. I only had to do that a few times. But most of the time, if you can get them to work with you, then you're going, they're not going to turn against you when it stops going on with staff because you turn staff members against you, you never get anything through. Yeah, well, it's key, Mary, and it's your right to raise it. It's, you really, really have, it makes such a tremendous difference if you have staff. The problem is, is on many of the issues you don't, but I, I, I like you and, and Alex, I'm sure can count the ones where I had staff at my back, it was a totally different world. 
we yeah. brought in, but, and I would say the amazing thing is when I look back on my little career, uh, the things which I had staff on side for, and when the, the smaller changes have, have all endured, we still have uh, little boat launches on the Rideau Canal. We still reconfigured Bronson and Carling, the intersection. We brought out the staff, the staff engineer, and we sat and we walked around it for like, like an hour or two, taking photographs and thinking, and I got him, he got excited himself, and I got excited about how we could reconfigure that, that intersection. And it's another place where we went from God knows how many horrible accidents a year to almost nothing. And the, the changes weren't enormous. Uh, they really they were bull boats on either side, taking out one of the bleed out lanes. Uh, the actual volume of traffic moving through the intersection and amazingly didn't change but the accidents diminished to nothing. And I, I look back and I, whenever you can get staff going with you, I mean, that's the super position. Yeah. And I, I just often like it. And they, the other thing that, that happens, those small details yep. make a community. They, yep. uh, we have kind of funny street lights and things in our area. We don't have street lights, we have lawn lights. I got the city in their bylaw to have the lawn lights become the street lights so they would maintain them so we'd have some light and we wouldn't get them all being changed mm. and that took a they it, it was it, it, they said well it's kind of unique i said there's nothing wrong with having unique things in a city the city shouldn't all be exactly the same mm. and they're trying to make all the bylaws and things everything is done exactly the same way in the same and that doesn't make a good city good cities have a lot of different communities that mm. look different act differently the people in them re do things in a different way possibly even but they all have things that they're doing what the community wants and that's that's really missing a lot now in ottawa everything mm. is this cookie cutter thing of having everything the same same. you're quite right right now right kind of the developers it's been really difficult although I, I still have a good rapport with many of the planners and things because I sort of respond to everything that goes on around here I'm get, getting a heritage grant and they've been very supportive and helpful on that so there are things that are still going on that you can work on to make them work but it's a heck of a lot of work on the councillor and some of the councillors aren't willing to put in that kind of work Mm -hmm. It sounds to me, just hearing the three of you talk, that actually the the staff is actually a critical variable in this. And I'm wondering, is it is yeah. it just the luck of the draw when a staff person is on side, or is there is there work you do that that brings them on side, or is it I, the person on this file whose staff it's not going to work? I can tell that. Well, well tell us a bit more about that. You ha you do have to understand the context that they work in. I mean, if the city policy is X. They have to live within that city policy. So, but if there's some discretion, then you've got the ability to work with that staff member, try to exploit that area of discretion to meet the community's needs. Um, I really think the luck of the draw is who you elect as a counselor. There's some who are laissez-faire, passive, uh, and you know are, are there to be the steward to vote on things at council and committee um, and respond when someone comes to their door, but aren't taking the proactive role. Uh, some so people like Clyde, people like Marion, who listened to their communities and went to battle for them. Uh, I mean, not every councillor is like that, and not everyone likes those kind of battles. Uh, so when you say the luck of the draw for staff, I mean, you, you do have to understand the policies that they work under. Uh, you have to know when to go to committee uh, to change a policy. It, it may be on a case basis. That's hard. But if you've got enough examples that the policy isn't working, and Clyde used the example of speeding in, in in the residential area of the Glebe, where the default was 50, yet the, in, in a suburban Nepean, the default was 40. Well, okay, he, he, with effort, he got that changed. Uh, and that, and it really, it, because all the other community associations, when they saw the situation, hey, we want that too. And that's how you build the coalitions. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, it, it takes some work, it takes uh, some educating. Sometimes you have to educate staff that this is the situation in, in this park. Uh, you have like what Clive did at, at Bronson and uh, Carly, do the walkabout so that they can see uh, the real situation uh, and then talk to some real residents that are struggling with the situation, that helps. So, I mean, you have to respect staff's position uh, you, you, you have to be careful about going to war because they're doing their professional job, but so are you doing your job representing the community. Uh, so it's a bit of a give and take, but you establish those relationships. Marianne was very successful in establishing relationships with planners so that she could work out whatever deal that she needed. Yeah. There are some cases, there are things that 
at least twice I had to write special reports to committees to get a change made. I worked with the staff and they agreed with me. But mm -hmm. they said, we can't with the rules we work under do it ourselves. So you have to do the report to the committee and we'll support it when it gets there. And I got, a, they wanted to take a road out that was going to make a, a secondary connection out from a large area. So instead of having everybody having to use one road for like 20 or 30,000 people, there's going to be a second one and the developer didn't want to put it in. They are putting it in. It's a new, it's a new development. But the, uh, it's, uh, and with new development, you have the double wicket. You don't have residents yet there to look at it. So you've got to try <laughs> to look at it through the eyes of people who aren't there yet. And that's kind of hard. But if you work at it, you can try to make it and by using other people who are interested in general in planning and not living there yet, but we're willing to step up and speak about it, it will work. It still works, not perfectly, but some at least some of the time. You know, the, the, one of the things that I've kind of thought about a lot since I've left politics and just uh, um, sitting at home writing books and stuff um, is, is that I used to think you could win... Uh, on this same the fact war, like the step one was win the fact war. Step two was uh, win the election based on the fact war. And step three was at council, uh, bring in the legislation and bylaws that would that would that, that you promised in in the winning fact with the winning facts. I now I now I'm not so sure that really that's it's it's a really it's a travail de, de moine, the work of monks. You know, I think what's more important is a vision a vision of what you want your city to look like. And that, because then if you have a, a clear vision of what you want your city to look like, then everything else kind of falls in place behind it. It's like having a, a kind of a natural official plan in your head. And the thing is, I don't think most people have any kind of, they have an idea of what Canada, what, what the national country to look like, but they really don't have much of an idea how they want their city to look like. And and uh, and somehow we have kind of lost that. I think well, amalgamation. That's, that's amalgamation exactly. Was gonna kill us on that. I think amalgamation was the worst thing that ever happened to Ottawa or any city across across the province. Yeah, it did. Well, I, I can tell you from a community association point of view. I mean, the, the residents in a neighborhood they know what they like. Uh, I mean, they, they like their quiet they, streets. They, they, they like their trees. They like their access to but parks. That's not the whole city, though. Then no, that's no. Like, the so city's very diverse. We had a, a blank page, and that's what I, I just had something. Yeah, well, we don't have a blank but, page. Uh, but in this uh, case, it, it started with a vision, and it started with some yeah. of the guts to put together three thousand two hundred acres of land. That took a lot of money and a lot of courage to do. And Teron had a vision. Yeah, well, yeah. well Terrence started it, but he yeah. left two years after the year after I moved in. He left, mm -hmm. and I got elected to council that year. It was in the night, 1969, and 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 we suddenly had, didn't have them anymore. We had the vision. We all bought the vision when we got there. So we, as a community, took it on and made sure the vision kept going. So the key so, community is always so important in making right. anything work out. Even when there is a vision, it can die. It can change. I can have a well, Peter Hume when I talked to him about some of the things when he was chair of planning, he said that doesn't matter anymore. It's out of date. It's not out of date. Mm. It's, it's so I want to go and bring up this issue about um, the vision for the city that Clive was talking about and having that vision and you being a representative of a ward, you being elected by a ward. And I'm wondering what you do in those situations. Imagine that the vision for the city, uh, some aspect of the vision sub optimizes something in your ward. It's not great for your ward. It's good for the city, not great for your ward. What happens when councillors find themselves in that situation? And if you, if there's a story you have about that, how do you navigate? Where do you stand when you know it is the right decision for the city, not great for my ward, and some of my constituents don't want it? How, what do you do with that sort of? I, I dealt with it a few times. And uh, one thing was coming up and I was talking to a staff member about this. And I said, well, this is something that, really did, that Orleans is gonna need and we need to support them in getting that. And they sort of looked at me and they said, well, you're taking a citywide view. And I said, yes, that's one of the jobs. I have two jobs here. One is a citywide view to get the whole city there. And the second is as a counselor for the ward to make sure that my ward gets, gets what they need within that view. And he, the staff member looked at me and said, you know, it's only three or four members in the whole city council who think beyond their ward. Well, you know, the biggest problem you have right now is you need to elect people, and this is what Clive was saying a bit, you need to elect people who will actually take that vision and say the vision of the city is over overreaching one. And then the vision for your ward has to fit into that and we can modify it a little bit in your ward, we can do some little details of things different, but don't break the whole vision. 
And that's what right now we've got. I said we went with amalgamation and I agree with Clive as a bad. We've gone from having 11 municipalities to 23. Because oh. many of the councillors, like they're, they've got their own little bit. When I went to subset another council one time, my councillor contacted me and said, what were you doing in my ward? Oh, it, but we, li we do live in a city, but Ken's, Ken's point is a valid point. I mean, Clive has the best example ever of something that was seen citywide, but really offended the residents in his ward, and that was Lansdowne. I mean, that was a big citywide issue, oh, and it had I huge impacts locally, and it was wrong decision, in my view, for council to pursue Lansdowne. But what did Clive do? And, and Clive, you tell the story better than me, but the, he spoke out for his community, and, and that's what a councillor has to do. There are 23 other councillors at the table, but you're responsible for speaking out for your community, for saying, look, you guys may think this is great, but it's going to do this, this, and this to my community, and the councillors have to hear this, and well, that's the job of the local representative. But, but, but Alex, the point I would make on Lansdowne is that it was, it was more important as a citywide issue than it was as a local issue. Lansdowne was but oldest, you had a job to do and you did it was it. the oldest park we have in, mm -hmm. in 1868 farmers donated to the city I thought it was an axial issue that, that would determine the way the city was going to go for the next 40 years and when I got really upset about it which I got upset about it still am it was never just about the fact that it was in in, in my neighborhood it was about about the fact that it was our central park it could have become our central park was 40 acres, two and a half kilometers, three kilometers from Parliament Hill, next to the only UNESCO World Heritage Site there is in the entire country. Uh, massive, wonderful history. Unfor only thing wrong with it is the last 25, 30 years, it, much of it had been paved over. But that wasn't a choice of the city, that was a choice of the, of, of, of the city council to use it that so, so abysmally. And so for me, when we fought and lost that battle, we just didn't lose it for, the, for my community. We lost it for the whole city. Because I said, to, I said to the city manager at the time, you realize, of course, if you rezone Lansdowne Park for a shopping mall, which is what happened uh, from a park, everything in the city is going to be a turkey shoot. The developers will know that, that if they can do this to Lansdowne Park in Capital Ward, which is the heart of the city, uh, you know, it is geographically the heart of the city, physically the heart of the city. And now if you look at Capital Ward, it's the shape of a heart. There's no other ward that's so connected as that ward. So you, if they can do that, and we, we went to war. We were at war for, for years on that. And this community raised a quarter of a million dollars to go to senior court, this appellate court in Toronto. I mean, it's, it was a story, an axial moment for the whole city. And we, we lost because the folks out in the, in, and, 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 you know, Canada is a special place with Mary. I, I didn't vote for Lansdowne. I voted I, for having the other location. We were special, but basically we got it rammed down our throats by the suburban amalgamated areas of the city. And, and we could not, get, they, they, and they've they been doing it ever since. I mean, that's the, that's the horrible truth. We lost our city when we lost Lansdowne Park. So Victor, th this is one of the challenges that every, every councillor has. You're there to represent your community, but you've got other folks, 20 other people around the table who don't know your community. So if you're gonna present an issue um, yes, you may be very articulate as an individual, but you have to build out other allies to change, to change attitudes. Uh, and it was tough. I mean, I supported Clive on Lansdowne uh, because, it, it, I mean, we won't get into the nitty gritty of it, but Clive is right. The, out, the other councillors who did not have a vested interest, who saw it as just another development opportunity, uh, it was easy for them to close their ears. Uh, to the concerns that were being raised, not just in Capital Ward, but because of what Clive said, it was our central park. But you know, uh, you you have to be effective in getting that message out. You have to try to find allies in those communities. Are the people there who value green space? Are the people there who value heritage? Who understand the value of that place? Um, all that. I want to go ahead, Marianne. All these high rise up and downtown. They're not adding any more parks. So yeah, that's that's parks. a feature of the official plan that, that people are pushing terrible. back on. And the, in the COVID, it yeah. really shows up because people have no place to go to walk except along the NCC lands. The city doesn't have anything. There's a couple so, of parks, not so much. The, the draft official plan, the, the, the one that's under consideration, city staff would now recognize that the downtown and inner uh, transect, which is the inner urban, are park deficient. 
And so they're now embedding policies to catch up, but it takes budgets to do that. And it's one thing to promise something in an official plan, very aspirational, but if you don't deliver at budget time, because you're all concerned about, is it a 2% tax cap, is it a 3% tax cap? Oh my Lord, we can only do so much. Then you don't achieve those goals. So that tension of aspiration and capability is, is continually there. And there's a disconnect because people buy the aspiration but when it comes to tax time, oh no, no, we, we well, don't they, want anything more than three percent. Right because you're going to maintain the character of communities and all sorts of stuff like that. But uh, then they say, oh no, higher density is more important, and they just completely and absolutely put. I'm, I'm going to pull us back from the official plan for a minute because I want to dive a bit into the reality of of city council and what's mm -hmm. going on with that. And to have us talk about that, I'm going to tee it up a bit by reading two things. So this is from the Ontario Municipal Councilors Guide that came out in 2018. And it says, working as a team with the rest of council and staff will contribute to making your time on council a success. Disagreements among council members are common, but it is important to remember that you are working towards a common goal. Then Samara Center for Democracy took a poll in 2020 of municipal politicians across Canada. On the, and one of the questions was, what's the worst part of the job of being a municipal councillor? Number one, was the nastiness and complaints that counselors receive is the worst part of the job. But number two, and I'm gonna read from this report from Samara, the second most common theme in complaints concerns colleagues on council, referring to council dysfunction, bullying, clashes of interests and values in difficult interpersonal scenarios. So what is the what should citizens understand about this reality of the relationships on council and what that means for that governing body being effective and what it means for an individual counselor to be effective where all these complex relationships need to be negotiated <clears throat> give us some sense of what that is marion what if you kick us off well, this is a that's a difficult one because the problem is it's the people that you're electing that do that so a lot of them come in without actually knowing what the job is or what it's going to be like. And, and that is, is too bad because they end up, I had a lot of them come to me because I had a lot of experience by the time I got on Ottawa Council and say, well, how do you do this job? And, and they should have known that before they ran for office, frankly, but they didn't. And the, uh, the other thing is they get pushed by their people in their own ward to do things. And they tend to become ward people as opposed to city people. We've already touched on that. And when you're doing that, that means that you're up against the other wards. I got very mad with Orleans one time when they, I had an industry that was growing in Canada that came there because it's a high tech and it wanted to be with high tech. And they, they were trying to get the city to agree to, have, to force that company to move to Orleans because they didn't have jobs. And what I told them is that I'm glad to help you get jobs there if somebody wants to go to Orleans, I'll work for you that way. But if a company wants to go elsewhere in its business company, you let them go where they want to go. And, the, uh, and that's the kind of thing that leads to this kind of destructiveness on councils. So it's a case of you need to have a lot more time. We did it a few times uh, when we got together to talk about sort of principles and things. We went to a golf course. I think you remember that, Alex, and, and, and mm -hmm. I think you were on council when we did that. Sometimes we've done that. It's only a one-time shot though. And it, it did help a lot to start having people understand better what the needs of the other parts of the city were because they really didn't understand that. But it's not done frequently enough and they're too much they're left on their own and they have to, uh, then they, they, just, they strike out because of that. And then you get people who are not getting what they want. So then they get mad at somebody who votes against them and that creates this, this trouble too. So it's a case of getting the right people there and then having procedures and processes that bring them together, not as on an issue that they're gonna fight over, but on something that they can talk about in general so they begin to get a better understanding of the city they're really dealing with. And there's very little of that done. Alex, you wanna follow up? Yeah, well, so I, I noticed a long time ago, cause I, I was at school board, then at Ottawa City Council, then at Regional Council, then at the Amalgamated City. And if you just dealt with the 20 odd people that were there in a fishbowl, um, it could get rather uh, contaminated uh, because of personalities and what have you. So how to break that? Because you're dealing with human beings. And uh, the way to break that is to try to 
bring get people out of their silos, bring someone from rural and Nepean down to your shopping center to show them what the parking situation is, get someone from uh, deepest, darkest Orleans to come and look at your park, why, so try to share these things because if you if if you just wait for until people get to committee, uh, they're all operating from their little silos. So you have to break those silos. They are ward people. You have to recognize that, acknowledge that, but you also have to broaden their perspective. And so if I want people to understand my neck of the woods, I'm going to have to go out to their community. It's a quid quo, quid pro quo. I'm going to have to go out to Orleans to understand why that person has a traffic problem there or go out to Canada to understand, okay, there's a green field there and we, you know the pipes won't ever come to, for the next 20 years. What's going to happen then? So people need to understand each other's problems. You have to be open. It's a two-way street. If I want people to understand my problems, I have to go out and understand their problems. So you build relationships. Uh, you know, uh, take them out of their boxes, build relationships. Because I, I if you just wait for that council meeting, um, you know, the die's already cast. I, I don't agree. I, I think you can have, I think I always had pretty good relations with uh, everyone in council, basically. Uh, we had, remember we had the Toronto, Ottawa uh, standing up on, on, on. Oh, yes. The, oh, yes. I still have that uh, jersey. Uh, we, we had lots of socializing and, uh, and lots of uh, kibitzing around the table. I never re re felt I wasn't, you know, get able to be having an enjoyable time with my fellow councillors, some more than others. But but the trouble with council is that there are structural and functional inequities. I mean, there's there's something seriously seriously wrong when you can get a you can. The, the the bog redevelopment outside of out, out near the near the Amazon warehouse. I mean that doesn't. I don't care how well you get along with anybody. That was rammed down the throat of the city by seven developer fed councilors who basically you know own them, and you can't get around ownership. You know, and 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 I, and not enough councilors are prepared to say it the way it really is. And the really way it really is is developers own what sixteen councilors. And uh, and they vote where the, the where the developers want them to vote. I mean, look at that bog development. It's absolutely against every planning principle the city has ever had. It's in the middle of nowhere. It has no services. That's a billions and billions of dollars worth of mistake. And and so they found a little hook to bring to so that the the the, the councillors who, who who couldn't couldn't vote for it really, unless they found that, that hook. And that hook was reconciliation. Well reconciliation is bullshit it's basically this is the this is this is the case where the citizens of ottawa and the and the algonquin people are in the same camp we're both getting screwed you know and and uh, and we see this over and over again until you solve these really serious structural inequities till you get developer money out of elections i mean look around the table and you you marianne and, and you and alex you know you the, the people did not taking money from from when developers voted qualitatively different virtually every time on a major issue from from the those who, those of us who didn't I mean, what does that tell you you know so so, I, so i so i i'm ken when you're doing your synapse city and, and citizen development i i think you know what you're what you're 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 talking about the micro stuff and the micro stuff has to be done if everyone hates your guts around the table they're going to vote against you just for the fun of voting against you so you, you, every councillor, and most councillors are pretty damn social. You don't get to be a city councillor if you're not good in your community. Uh, and and I, I, I never saw, I never really met a city councillor who wasn't good at, at, at glad handing. But I met lots of city councillors who, who weren't their own man or their own woman. So I'm going to use. You have to look uh, at. You have to follow the money on the Taiwan thing because uh, even though it became a surprise. Alex, Alex let, let's not go down the Taiwan oh, road. Okay. The, okay. I want to back out and and use Clive what you were saying about structural issues to switch to our our Q and A because a number of Q and As have come in, a number of questions have come in. I want to make sure we go there. Um, I'm just aware in this conversation there are so many interesting paths we could have gone down and explored really in depth. So I just appreciate your honesty, your straightforwardness in the conversation we've been having. The reason I'm, I'm using, Clive, what you were saying about structural issues is we invited people um, to have questions sent ahead of time. And we had one very thoughtful question come in. That's a structural question. So I'm going to read you the question. And then the fellow, it's from Miklos Horvath, and he, uh, he goes on to sort of 
stretch out his thinking. So the question is this, the city seems to be divided along an urban suburban fault line. Could any form of electoral reform help break this divide and work better for the residents of Ottawa? Then he goes on to say, my main concern is that there is an evident split between urban and suburban councillors within Ottawa, and this is leading to uneven decisions that, from my point of view, I don't know what his award is, by the way, tend to benefit suburban voters at the expense of urban voters. This is especially evident when it comes to development. Also, as the suburban councillors outnumber the urban ones, there is now a one-sided stacking of certain committees, which again tend to favour those in the suburbs more times than not. He goes on, on to say that I believe there are some models that should be explored that could even out representation. He mentions the city of Vancouver, which uses an at-large system where the councillors represent the population as a whole and not by wards. So the question is, is this, so he has a diagnosis. There's this issue about urban subor, suburban and a suggested, suggested remedy of electoral reform as something to look at. So I'm wondering what your take is, and we could spend the next half hour on this. So I'm not gonna ask you to go in deep, but just in general, do you think the diagnosis has some validity to it? And do you think the remedy that he's suggesting is something we should be looking at? Who wants to kick that off? And I'll, I'll jump in right away because I'm a, when I was elected trustee at the Auto Board of Education, we were elected at large and I brought in uh, the equivalent of wards because you needed to have local representation. Otherwise the majority would dominate. And if you think suburbanites dominate now, go to a large system, it'll all be suburban because that's where the votes are. It's a democratic process. You do want wards because each community is different. So uh, how to change this, because he's right about the urban suburban split, um, make those issues citywide issues. They're not just downtown issues. Believe it or not, there's a food bank, more than one food bank out in Kanata. Do people in Kanata know that they have the same problem about people in these accessing food banks as my community in, in Britannia, they Belltown? They, oh, do. I, they do, it's there. So uh, you, it, you have to use the political process to try and get people to buy into values that make sense at council. If you have a 40% turnout, which is what it is in municipal elections, then you're letting 40% of the people decide who your city government is. We have to do better than that. So it's not electing at large because if you think 16 votes coming from suburbia is going to dominate, try 22. Five, do you want to add to this? Yeah, I, I think there's a couple of things you can do. First thing is you got to get election, elect, elect uh, developer money out of elections. You got to find a way. It's a poison. It just and that's what's that's more than anything else that's creating the divide because the money doesn't flow into people like Capital Ward or Somerset or Bay Ward because we don't take it, but they take it. And so you got to get the money out and 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 that'll be fought. You know, it, it'll be fought tooth and nail by the developers because it's for them. It's gold, gold. It's coffee money for them. You know, uh, uh, seventy thousand dollars or something like that for to 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 uh, to uh, to uh, the council councillors on the planning committee. Man, if if that that that, that, that translates into billions, so so you got to get first thing is you got to get the development. And the second thing is I, I would like to go back to uh, um, uh, the two tier system we had before. I'd like to have a regional system for the big big stuff and go back to the small city for the small stuff. Then you get that flexibility response uh the stuff you need because a lot of stuff is very detailed and you get the big the big city stuff for that or do as the, some somebody recommended at the time which i fought because i thought it was i thought it wasn't a good idea at three cities you get a canada canada city basically an orleans city and a central city and marianne your thoughts well I think there's a number of things there. First of all, at large, if you go all the way at large, the cost of running an election becomes so, so high that you're only going to get rich people wriggle to run. And that would not be very good. You have to raise the same money as the mayor does. And that's tough. And they, uh, it's tough enough to raise money for your election campaigns as it is. And the, because most people don't have a big amount of money they can give you. The, uh, and some many, and so that's one thing. Uh, I don't think there is, the divide is not quite as clear cut as they're saying. Because when they say in suburban, that they lose, they lump all the rural areas in with the earth, the, the developing cities, because uh, we are all developing cities. I mean, Canada Sitzville now is a city of 130,000 people. It's a small city in its own right, with a downtown and business areas and the whole works. And the and I think that's not always understood. And so it's a, it's a reaction a little bit against it. But we have a lot of different issues because we have a lot more greenfield developments happening, 
but we're also getting redevelopment. We do have poor people. We do have needs and things like that, which have to get met, just the same as anybody else. Sometimes uh, we, have, we have public housing. I helped get public housing into Canada years ago. But the, uh, man, most people don't even know it's there because we did it pretty well. But the, uh, I think one of the things that I, I'd like Clive's view, I did not think that it was a good idea going to the one tier government. What's happened now with everybody, the developers getting control, that's what happened when that happened. When it was smaller communities, the staff members in Canada were, were far, far closer to the elected people and they worked together on issues and the developers had to come to scripts and do what was sent from the city hall out, not the developer into the city hall, which is what's happening now. And the, uh, and the two tier system worked well. It was, there was not duplication like people used to say there was, and the cost didn't go down. They, they made them go down at the beginning because they stopped doing any work and, re, and looking after our infrastructure, which we're now suffering from terribly. But the, uh, and, and, and a local area could do something, this thing a little bit differently, and this other one could do that thing a little bit differently and do what they wanted in their own community. And uh, I, think, I think it was a really big mistake and it's not just here, it's elsewhere as well. Because the city's gotten so big that one person can't keep a handle on all of it. Like Ottawa's huge in area, and I know it pretty well. I, I spent ten years selling real estate across the whole city, so I know my way around this city. But it's, it's changing so much, and the uh, it, it's it's just and it's, and it's a lot of cookie cutter stuff. We go into Bar Haven now. If all the house, these huge, huge housing developments happening, they've never been able to get a real town center going. And even the town center in Canada is not going well. It's the business park that's gone well and the businesses, even the other businesses want to go there. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's a case of not being able to cope with it. I remember we had the region, we had, Ottawa had 16 members on regional council and the other 10 municipalities had 14. We called oh, it 16, 16. It was 16, 16. Not no, when I first was on, I was on. No, it was 1616 when I got on in, in, no, in, in 1980, uh, it was 1614. And the, um, and in 1614, we called ourselves the other 14. Because if something was happening in Orleans, they would ask us, because we understood what was the development was happening. City of Ottawa people didn't understand that that well. And even though they had more votes, they never all voted together. So if we wanted together to get something through, we just got a couple of Ottawa people on our side and we were all set to go. And that's not the way to run a city either. Uh, but the region only looked after the big things, the water lines, the sewer lines, the, the landfill, the transit, those kind of things that cost partners and have to be all integrated. Well, you don't have to integrate your street lights. You don't have to integrate how you look after your roads, your local roads. You don't have to integrate all the recreation programs you do and the park systems you have and all of that. We were, we were a city in the country. We wanted more parks. We've had to late recently have a court battle to keep what mm -hmm. was agreed to by the developer in the first place. Yeah. Fortunately, the courts agreed with us. But the uh, it, it's uh, but and and the thing that if we'd had smaller ones, maybe what happened with Clive and with the Cleve, which is an important area. I mean, I, my family was in the Cleve. I went to Cleve Collegiate for my last year of high school and things like that. It's a beautiful part of the city, and it's been just sort of ranked over. It. And a lot of it was protected in the center part, fortunately. But the edges of it are really beginning to go. And the uh, and that's what's happening right across the whole city. So let's let's get down to saying I think Clive's view of saying you need to have a framework for the city, which is a vision, and then within that vision you have to have what what are the principles of the Canada concept was each little community has its own character. Right? You don't have to have three communities in a Barhaven all the same they could have their own character too. And that makes for the versatility and the differences that meet different people's needs. And it's tough, tough even for me to maintain it here. And I shudder sometimes at things we've lost, but we've still got enough of it around and the people in the community will fight for it, which is a good thing, but it's you shouldn't have to fight for good things for your community. I'm gonna go, thank you all for your thoughtful response to that uh, question about reform. Um, I'm going to switch it over to Nick because I know there have been quite a few questions that have come in. And so let's spend the last bit of time uh, with the questions that, that have come in from our viewers. Yes. Uh, thank you all for the exciting discussion so far. Um, I just want to say, as a kid who grew up in Stittsville, Kanata always felt pretty urban to me. 
but <laughs> I've, I've since gained an appreciation for uh, the, the differences of the real downtown. Um, so the question I wanna go to first is one, and uh, forgive me, Sharon, if I don't nail it on the head because you've framed it a few different ways, but it's regarding tiny homes and about zoning for experiments like this. How could someone lobby the city of Ottawa to permit a designated area or a specific carve out to build tiny homes, coach houses, laneway homes, whatever term Already you there. want for it. Um, Already there. Already there. The policies in place for coach houses already there. Um, so basically uh, what, what a person should do is um, make an application, go talk to a planner, see what zoning is applied to their neighborhood, see what the bylaw says for coach houses, see if they meet the standards because you have to have a certain amount of space. So, the, but that, that coach house policy came about because people uh, during an official plan process, not this one, a previous one, uh, saw opportunities where this was happening in other communities and said, why can't we do this here? The staff were sent off to look at it, came back with the report, went through public consultation. Ultimately, the policy was adopted. But Fair right enough. now, we do have policies that support coach houses. But the lesson to be learned from it is, where, when the opportunity comes up to review zoning, to review planning, when the city's re reaching out for ideas, People come up with ideas, and then you ask staff to look at it. Uh, they look at best practices in other communities. We learn what Montreal does. We learn what Vienna does, or Venice does, or Oslo does. And uh, then uh, there's a debate in the public. A report comes to committee. You hear from the public delegations. And sometimes it takes more than one effort to make that policy change. But the coach house one, that's something we did, oh geez, right. it's uh, not about 15, there. 20 like, years ago. What they were asking about is a little different than that, Alex. These, they've mm -hmm. got these tiny houses, even on the coach house one, there's a certain minimum size square that's footage right. size that you have to use. And it's- So and how tiny is tiny? Yeah, they want, so, they're looking at doing, so there, but there, it should be a way, and I think there can be, that you actually, you'd have to get a piece of land where you could do it and somebody willing to do it. Then you have to actually apply to have a change made on that one to do a demonstration project. And I would like to see more types of demonstration projects with some of the things that people are coming up with. If they're done small and they don't work, then you're not wrecking the whole city by having a policy that's citywide. And, uh, but if it does work, then you can uh, work out how to put it into the system. And I think there's not enough of that happening. Excellent. People have people have to want it, but but the concept is is not new to Ottawa. That's why there is a coach house bylaw, and you, people may go look at it. It may satisfy their needs if they got something different. Because we're, it, you know, housing is evolving all all the time, uh, and people are coming up with innovative ways. And and there is a way to to give uh, some life to that. Marianne's thought about a pilot project that works. The other thing is er, that people really don't know every single house in Ottawa is allowed to have a second unit as long as you can have separate entranceways and various other things. That was a provincial policy brought in. Most people don't know about it, but they, you can change your house into a duplex that way. Yep. But you have to follow some rules. Excellent. Well, um, I think uh, Sharon's last comment, and I won't treat it as a question, but just a comment is that perhaps Lansdowne could be an innovation space for coach houses down the road. So something for everyone to chew on. There. Keep the rest of what's left as a park. Don't build anything more. Yeah, you, you, they're not manufacturing parks anymore. So you want to say, uh, want to protect what you have. Yeah, find there some old go. houses yeah. that you can take down to put the new ones up. Um, the, next, the next question I've got here is, why do we never hear about the wider municipality of Ottawa Gatineau? How does Gatineau fit into the whole picture and, and how should citizens see Gatineau's piece of the puzzle? Well, just have to look at where we, where we intersect with Gatineau. And clearly we have a transit system. There are OC transfer buses that go into Gatineau. There are STO buses that come into Ottawa. Uh, we have people working, uh, living in Ottawa, working in Gatineau and vice versa. Um, the mayors do meet on a regular basis. We do have this third party called the National Capital Commission. But the fact of it is, Gatineau is in the province of Quebec, different set of rules, different uh, legislation. Ottawa is in the province of Ontario, different rules, different legislation. 
um, unless someone creates a true national capital district spanning both boundaries, you're going to have to respect the fact that there are different provincial jurisdictions which have different implications on municipal government. But we do talk to each other. There are formal and informal arrangements. Uh, could we do better? Always could do better. Uh, but there's no ignoring the fact that we have a neighbor across the way and, nor, and they don't ignore us either. Uh, no, it's, we need we need a rail link, uh, a rail loop. Oh yeah, that'd be good. That's what we need. And we, we used to have it too. Wales Bridge. We, initially, before it got killed, that's what we were going to do. With the north south was going to go right across the Prince of Wales Bridge. We bought the Prince of Wales with ten million dollars. It was ready to roll. Uh, and uh, one of the huge problems we have is as coming together as a city is physically it's actually difficult. Bridges are bottlenecks. You can't sort of easily try. I mean, the whole, most horrid transfer in the city is is 50,000 people use it every day. It's getting off the bus and getting on another bus to go across one of those bridges. It's ugly. So we could have, we could have cured that 20 years ago. Until you get physical connections know. that work, you can't have political and, 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 and uh, social connections. But Gatineau was offered that when, when, when Alex was chairing the transport committee and I was on it, sure. we were working on that. But Gatineau decided not to have rail. They decided they were going to go to a rapid bus system. Yeah, but we never Gatineau. cared about it enough on this side. We, we, we could have used federal muscle on this one thing. There's a dozen ways we could have done it. And there was never mother, never much aspiration. And and Alex is right. I mean, there's there, there are two different cultures. There are two different provinces, two different languages. Combien de personnes parlent des deux langues au conseil? Pas beaucoup. You know, so uh, uh, that's it's a different world. And we, we haven't done much to, to address it. But we can't ignore each other either. So the fact that the mayors do meet, the fact that there is this um, these arrangements between SDO and OC Transpo, uh, clearly we can do better. But the institutional barriers are there. It's a problem. Uh, well, I'll say one thing just on the rail side. I know that the Moose Consortium is a group that Synapsity worked with in the past. Uh, a private group trying to get together and get some energy behind that that idea. So uh, never say die on things like that. Um, next question. Um, it, it came up a couple times early on, but I want to play the part of the uh, neophyte here and say we've talked about the official plan and the FCA has been pushing to delay the official plan until 2023 after the next Ottawa election. So for those who don't know, what does the official plan do? And if it's so important, why should it be delayed? Well, it is important. Uh, it's a rather large complex document is to govern the growth of the city uh, to 2046. And um, there, we're expecting to grab on to another 400,000 residents. Where do you put them? So part of the debate is, uh, do you expand the urban boundary, more greenfield development? Some people see that as urban sprawl. Do you deal with, uh, deal with it by absorbing it within built communities through intensification, which if you have a lot of intensification uh, has an impact on the quality of the neighborhood. So these, these are uh, it's a large document that covers um, things from parks to culture, to uh, urban development, design, what have you. And it was released uh, in November, in the middle of COVID. And so community associations uh, getting a 265 page document plus appendices plus maps have been trying to wade their way through uh, all these policies and programs. And uh, the city is being very aggressive. 60% of the growth is to occur within the city boundaries, 40% outside. Major changes for uh, you know, idyllic suburbia, uh, a lot of uh, complicated changes, particularly along the LRT corridors, which has to have more population to justify that massive investment so people can walk, not use their car to the LRT corridors. Uh, so some of that makes sense, but how does it translate down to the neighborhood? So the community associations, there's 57 of them that make up the Federation of Citizens Associations, FCA, have said, look, this is way too big, way too complex. We, you want to have our comments in by, at the time, February 17, now it's March 12, no can do. So the politicians wanted the official plan done and over with before the municipal election, because they didn't want this to be an election issue. The communities are saying, 
hold the phone. We want time to sort this out. Yes, we understand there has to be some intensification, but we want to make sure that we don't lose the quality of life, keep the trees, keep our walkability in our neighborhoods. We want time. So that's the tension right now. That's why the FCA is saying, give us the time. We don't care about your uh, municipal election. In fact, that's a good thing because we want to have some values show up at council when we deal with this. So we would like to see it by 2023. I, I think I think the whole official plan stuff stinks. And uh, <laughs> well, okay. it's the same. It's the same. I've been fighting the, the urban growth since I was a coordinator of the Federation of Citizens Association. The first official plan came back back in 1972 or something mm -hmm. like that. It's just and it never gets anywhere. It, it always the developers just simply we remember we, we, we so one of the things that never changes is is it's basically just a roadmap for for where the developers are going to make their billions and and for example what a official plan should have it should have attachments like in environmental sustainability criteria so that you hear these people say oh we gotta we gotta densify we gotta go to 60 stories here we got to 40 stories. well you know what i've never seen a single environmental study done of what the advantages are to having 20 stories versus six never seen one so there's no measure when they bring forth all these all these new policies, you don't have anything to stack. You don't have any environmental or, or economic thing to stack it against. It's just done on on the most most uh, the simplistic of 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 of, of, of thought processes. I want to, for example, there's all kinds of. Uh, I'm very suspicious of high rises as 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 as, as environmentally friendly. They basically these tall buildings are 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 um, energy sinks in the winter and summer. They're very fragile. If you can't if you can't get electricity pumping those elevators up and down, you can't occupy them. And let me tell you, if, if it, it, what they discovered in with climate change and, and, and just discovered in Texas, your whole world changes if you can't get electricity. And that and that's going to happen. It's happening more now. It's it's been happening steadily. We've got tornadoes in the city now. We've got wild climate change, and it's all going to get worse. And we don't have a single environmental study. That will uh, create a set of criteria that you can attach to the official plan and move you forward. So until I, so I'm agreeing with you, Alex. Why 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 approve this? It's crazy. It's just another way of forcing the developer agenda. That's what it is. It's got nothing to do with us. Uh, well, unless Marianne, you have a comment on that, I think that's well, a segue into official plan is supposed to lay out the general framework, but they quite frankly, as they make a whole lot of nice words in it and then they don't follow them. The nice words are nice, mm. but they should have some action that goes with them because if they're done properly, we might get this vision of the city that Clive talks about and we're not getting it. Right. Well, that's the I'll... disconnect. That's the disconnect between council uh, looking at something aspirational and then budget time. Budget time, the very practical 3%, that's it, got to live with it. And yet, you know, inflation has already eaten up a lot of that uh, tax room. So, you know, they, they say one thing for the official plan, and Marianne's quite right, they, they don't follow through. The budgets aren't there to make real those words. And that's a real problem. And that undermines the credibility of local government. Say one thing, do something else. Developers seem to run City Hall. That that's erodes the public's confidence. But we're still stuck with a system where only 40% of the people vote. So there's all kinds of disconnects here on the level of government that affects people the most. Excellent. Well, I'm, I'm going to jump off of some of Clive's comments. Uh, Lois Ross has a question here um, about the environment. Specifically, what policies does the city have in place to help mitigate climate change? Are policies or developments filtered through a climate change lens? And uh, are there any examples of either citywide or small scale efforts to mitigate climate change? I can't tell you one, but my living classroom is one. The city actually so, got the developers to put in wet meadows and ponds and various other things in a very wide range, rather than actually uh, putting everything into pipes and things like that and keep the environment there. And that has brought back birds and vegetation and all sorts of good things. And it's certainly, and then people say, you put this path in with this nice little bridge and it's a green cup. And it's underwater. I said, yes, it's supposed to be underwater. It's a floodplain and you're leaving the floodplain to mm. be flooded and not the houses. 
Sawmill, that's a very unique so, one. Yeah, Sawmill Creek is another good example of some really nice work that was yeah. done. To, uh, to, New uh, stuff is better. Pardon? Some of the newer the things. City has, the city does have a climate it, change plan. It's, it's, it's new. Better with water, yeah. but but uh, um, the, the, the crying is we don't have a lens, a really authentic, uh, usable lens to which you can examine how, how we're growing the city. So we're always often arguing in, 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 in kind of these little silos. We all have our favorite little subjects and we don't have a common, uh, neither a common vision nor a, a common set of criteria by which to judge how we should move forward on any particular thing. But be that as it may, there are some good things that do happen amazingly. And I think Samuel Creek and your example, Marion's are, are both really good examples. It's a new territory for municipalities. Uh, the city has adopted a climate change program. Is it strong enough? Is it adequate enough? I mean, Clive is right. Uh, it takes time to change culture to bring that lens into play. And it really comes from bottom up. It comes from citizens saying, look, climate change is real. What's the city doing about it? How come we've got uh, all these fossil fuel cars that are, and trucks picking up the garbage? Can we not do something smarter than that? And that's eventually you elect people, eventually uh, those changes happen. But the push comes from the public. It's not top down. Mm. I agree. Public has to do their own part too. They often do. <laughs> I mean, the Blue Box program came, came from the public. That was not top down. It was taken over later by the province, mandated. But it started out with the community saying, hey, we got all this garbage. Some of it can be salvaged. And that's where the Blue Box program came from. People forget that. It's yeah. been around now for about 40 years, but that's where it originated from, from grassroots. The last, last trick up was started in Canada and we had a special event because we had to sort glass by color at that time and we ground it. So we had a, an official opening of the glass thing to uh, to grind glass with the local high school band playing and everything else. And that's how I had to send it to Montreal. That was back in the early seventies. I think the bike the bike infrastructure too is all really a result of people working hard. Yeah, there's a lot of good people working council on to, to change, and <clears throat> there's been a lot of nice changes there. I, I love. I, I mean, we couldn't get paint on the roads when I first started. Now there seems to be actual budget for paint, which is nice to see. Um, you know, down in down in Hindenburg, there's a line that they say you know, Doring Lane. You know, I mean, I, I think ten years ago one didn't even know what a Doring Lane was. Now people understand that you can't op throw open your car door when you park it without looking. And so there's, on the bike side, we've seen steady improvement. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, and I think there's COVID has changed a lot of the way people are looking at cities. I mean, I'm very hopeful that, uh, that um, uh, council, the next council, I don't think this next, the mayor will not stay. He will be defeated if he runs and he, he won't, probably won't run. So the next council is going to be different, really different. And I think it's going to come forward with a, with uh, from a, a citizens, a group of citizens who have much clearer idea of what they want done and why. So I'm, I'm certainly uh, optimistic for the next in, in, in two years for, for some good changes. Well, then perhaps we'll have this as the final uh, question. It's uh, one that came earlier on, earlier on in the call. So what is the vision for Ottawa? Clive mentioned vision. Uh, what is each of your visions for Ottawa going forward? And this is in like a minute. Is that right, Nick? <laughs> yeah, you get six, 60 second slot. Yeah. <laughs> the 60 oh. second vision. Yeah. yeah. So it, it, we, the official plan talks about 15 minute neighborhoods. I happen to live in one where you can walk to safely uh, on a street uh, that has trees uh, to get something what you need either from the drugstore or from a bank or from uh, a service that's nearby um, that I don't have to drive my car to that I can actually pedal my bike on the street safely and not have to worry about uh, being uh, sideswiped by uh, somebody going by at 50 clicks an hour. So it's a safe city. It's a green city. It's a walkable city. Um, it has good transit so that we can get from A to B uh, without, again, relying on the Queensway being that parking lot. So uh, it's a livable city. Uh, and, some, and to be a livable city these days means you have to respect climate change and make changes accordingly. Uh, but it starts out with the neighborhood. It's got to be a place that you feel comfortable living in, that you uh, can talk to your neighbors and go down to the park uh, and play with your kids or your grandkids. Uh, and those facilities are there. 
I think we should apply to be an, an urban biosphere under the UN. And we should, all our policies should be directed towards qualifying. We don't qualify now, but we have the basic guts of it here. We've got all the water, we've got three rivers, uh, we've, got, uh, we've got clean air, basically. Uh, we are a dream city, really, in terms of the uh, resource advantages that we've got when you look around the world. Very few that compared us. And I know when, when I was a counselor, we, we inquired and we said, yes, they would consider us being a, a, a biosphere protected area, an urban one. But it's going to take a whole different change and mindset. And, you know, you can't, you can't be throwing up 26-story buildings on every, every corner and, and expect to qualify for this. Because I'll tell you right now, it, it won't meet the sustainability uh, criteria that they have. But we could do that, and it would give us a vision of where we want to go for the next 25 years. And we would change the city then, I think, to something that costs us less to run, not more. The trouble is with with on these unsustainable policies it actually costs more to run every year, not less. So uh, uh, sustainability should be cheap, and it should be green, it should be friendly, and it should be the kind of city where we connect to each other easily and uh, and not without without requiring a car. So uh, I think that's my my green vision, and it and I. Part of it is is moose. You know, there's lots of different elements that I think they have a great idea for for putting the trains back on the old tracks. Uh, makes perfect financial sense. Serve a lot sport. So we can do it. It's there, and I know that some of the councillors understand that they're there now. And uh, um, I I just couldn't stand the frustration of of being on a council where I saw us going in the wrong direction. You know, year after year. So I'm a, in spite of my passion this evening, I am. Happy I left and happy to be where I am. You know, looking at it from a slightly different perspective, instead of looking at from the top down, which is what the city tends to do now, you start with what's important. And this is how Canada was built. It started with the idea of a child on a tricycle and what the neighborhood could be and the design of the house and the homes and what kind of homes you need and how they're designed. Then you put them together in smaller groups that people can as well do and can get around very easily. You put these smaller groups together into neighborhoods and then through neighbors into communities and communities into a city with a town center, but lots of open space that so nature is a critical part that you have to be able to have it and that having the trees and things in Ottawa helps keep us having good air. We need those. And so I would like them to start saying, it's like a, rather than having a developer comes in and they want to do this on this piece of property and it's looked at in isolation for just that piece of property. Let's look at how that hits into that whole neighborhood. And, and we create not, we don't create developments, we create neighborhoods communities. And, 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 and communities within the city. And then you have some, some centralized facilities downtown, but the downtowns are likely going to be decentralized more now because of COVID. So we have to be also flexible enough to adapt to those things. So I want a city that's adaptable too. And, and what the, uh, Clive is talking about with the climate change and everything else there, those are crucial. They, I was so upset, concerned with the Conservation Authority when I, they said, when they had the floods out in, in Constance Bay, I said, well, when we're doing the development, shouldn't we take a look at the, the, the floodplains things? Well, we said, the, the, we, we only can map 100 year flood lines now and they look like they're changing, but we don't know how much they're changing. So well, can, why, why shouldn't we make them a bit bigger so that we are prepared if, if the flood lanes are now going to be what was a hundred year flood lane is now what would have been 150 years before, change it. But they, the rules hold them back. They're actually provincial rules sometimes hold them back too. So we've got to start looking at what's happening in the world and adapt our city to that as well. It's not an easy job, but it needs to get started. Well, uh, I will I say- Nick, as a, as a board member, I just want to take my 30 seconds to say what Synapse City's vision is of the city. Because Synapse City has a belief that, they're, that we need to build the social trust among key stakeholders, as in citizens, institutions, the government, um, businesses, so that we come together in a shared civic community that builds the city by listening, not yelling, by not having war as the paradigm, but aligning together and being able to be in conversation. This, this evening has made it really clear how far we have to go to still get there, right? So that we are joining together in a, in a shared project called Ottawa. Um, and we're not there yet, but that's part of our agenda. 
Um, for people who are listening, I'd also invite you um, just in chat before you go, if there's, if you want us to do this again, let us know if there are particular things you'd like us to host conversations about, or if you'd like these panelists to come back and take on specific issues, um, let us know uh, what that might be for you. And I'll turn it over with that said, I'll turn it over to you, Nick. Uh, yes, well, in addition to having you guys come back and speak here again, uh, we do have a request in the Q&A for you three to run for council again. So I'll just leave that, I'll leave that with all of you. Uh, <laughs> I decided when I turned 80, it was time to retire. Council, not from life, not from community, but I, I got lots of other things I can do. And there I got you go. Placement. Um, and the other thing I'll mention is that if you liked the discussion here today, you like Synapsity's work in general, and you want to help us keep it going, uh, we are uh, incubated under the Social Planning Council. I've posted a link to the donation page. All you have to do is make sure you select Synapsity as the fund in the drop down uh, when you're filling it out and it will get back to us and we can keep on sustaining work like this. Um, I think that's it. We're getting lots of uh, uh, kudos and, and thank yous in the chat. I would like to say thank you to each of you. Uh, I learned a ton. Uh, Ken, thank you for steering. Uh, you know, counselors are a, a, a rowdy bunch, but I think you handled it well. And um, I, I really do hope we'll all get to speak again real soon. It was a great conversation. Thank you to the three of you for joining us. It was nice, a, for it was nice to see you, Marianne and Alex. Yeah, yeah. Here, Clive. Yeah, Alex, once in a while. I haven't seen you for a while, though, Clive. I haven't been around very much. I'm waiting for my, I, I'm, I'm in the first line for getting inoculation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, take care, you guys. <laughs> there you go. Well, Thank you, everybody. Have a great night.